Good to see you this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we go to worship. Uh, what an exciting day, this first day of November. Amen. Let's go to the Lord. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, we're glad that uh, we were able to experience last night, and I know we're all still excited about how we were able to connect with our community this this uh, weekend and, and do our fall festival, Lord. I, I thank you for the people that were able to come help, Lord. I thank you so much for them. I thank you for those that we were able to interact with. And, uh, Lord, now, as we just kind of turn and take this excitement, you know, maybe maybe come to you uh, this morning with anticipation, knowing that, that you are a good God and you will do something in our lives if we will allow you to, God. And, and Lord, I just pray as we come and worship, uh, we'll be able just to set things aside and we won't uh, be distracted by anything good or bad, uh, but we'll just turn our heart and our mind towards you this morning as we, when we come to worship. And Lord, we love you and we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to come. And Lord, Amen. we pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. We pray. All God's people said? Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody. Some of us are standing. We'll go ahead and start worship.
Y'all can go ahead and sit down if you want to. Father, Lord, I just come to you this morning, Father, just giving you thanks again, Lord, for who you are, Father, for what you do, Father, for what you continue to do. Lord, I just pray that everybody in this building, at least, and everybody that's listening, Father, if they haven't voted, Lord, Father, that they will go vote by Tuesday, Lord. Father, and I pray that they're letting the Lord lead them with who they pray for, Lord. Father, we don't know what's going to happen in the next five minutes, much less a year or two or three for the, with the time that will be here for the next president. Father, I just pray again that you're leading the people, Father, as they vote, Father. So we vote for who you want in there, Father, who you led in our minds to put in there, Lord. Father, I am also just so thankful that in another couple of days, maybe we won't see all those political advertisements, Lord. And the telephone, Father, on our phones, on TV, Father, in the mail. Just a big waste of time, Lord. Father, because you're going to put in there who you want anyway. Amen. Father, I thank you for that, Lord. And Father, also, I just continue to pray, Lord, as we continue to be in this pandemic, Lord. Father, one day we hear that it's doing well. The next day we hear it's not doing well, Father. Father, we don't know what's really going on sometimes. Uh, last night we had an, an activity here, Lord, and Father, you would think it was just mostly normal. Some people had masks, some had no masks, Lord. Father, but I didn't see any worry on anybody's face, Father, as far as fear, as far as anything like that, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord, that so far, for the majority of us anyway, we haven't had any serious uh, complications from that. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, that you're blessing this church in that way, Lord. Father, also I pray for the rest of this morning, Lord, as Brother John, as Pastor John, leads us, Lord, Father, in another message today, Lord. Father, that whatever he comes out of his mouth, Lord, Father, we'll take that to heart. Lord, and there'll be someone, at least one person, Lord, Father, that'll need that this morning, Father, maybe hopefully more than one. Father, I thank you for his dedication. Father, for his uh, continued uh, obedience, Lord. Amen. Father, when he accepted this position. Actually, he accepted this position a long time ago, Lord, but of course he didn't know it, and we didn't know it. But thank you, Lord, for leading him in what he's doing. Amen. Father, thank you for... Rebecca and Zachary, Lord. Father, as they're up here just continuously leading us in music, Lord, practicing all the time. Father, thank you that we have that. Amen. Father, just thank you for everything, Lord. Thank you for life again. And Father, I'd like to pray again for everyone that's here and everyone that's listening, Lord. Father, I pray that you have a healthy time, Lord. Father, that you will grow in the Lord today, Father. But most of all, Lord, you have to know the Lord in order to receive a blessing from him. And Father, I pray that each person in here, each person listening, has that relationship. And if not, today may be the day, Lord, hey. Father, that you accept that. Father, thank you again, Lord. And Father, I just ask all these things in the most precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And i got a few announcements I'm going to go over while I'm up here this morning. <clears throat> that you may uh, know about and you may not know about. The biggest one is the Thanksgiving meal that's coming up the 22nd. Uh, a couple of Sundays from now, it'll be right after church, approximately noontime or whenever church ends. It'll be catered by Cracker Barrel. Uh, it's basically going to be for the congregation, the people that are here that morning. Sign-up sheet's already out there in the foyer. Uh, if you could sign up no later than next Sunday, because uh, Pastor John has to call, and they have to get all that set up. There's a lot of people doing meals, so they have to have it pretty far in advance. Uh, senior adult Bible study, November 12th, Thursday, this month. Brother John, I've been, uh, Pastor John, I've been there a couple times, and uh, he does an excellent job. You don't have to be a senior. If you're off from work and want to come, you're welcome to come. Anybody can attend it. Uh, he goes over it uh, verse by verse. Takes an hour. He's sure that he's done in an hour. You're only going to be in there an hour at the most. And it's excellent. So, and then sometimes people go out to eat lunch afterwards, sometimes not. But it's an excellent time to be in there. 
Uh, the other thing is the Deacon of the Week is Bobby Watkins this week. His number's in the bulletin if you need him. So at this time, if you will, we'll stand up and greet one another, wave to them, however you want to do it, go over and shake their hand, do whatever you want to do, and then the children will come down front. So go ahead and greet one another in the, in the name of Jesus. Bible story to you today. Uh, it comes from 
told them to get into their boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake. And Jesus went up on the mountainside alone and prayed. Later that evening, the disciples were quite far out into the lake when the wind began to blow and the waves began to bounce their boat around the water. Have you ever been in a boat before? Y'all ever ridden in a, in a boat of any kind? A canoe, a boat, a paddle boat, a big boat, a ski boat, cruise boat, anything like that? Now, what happens to the, when, it, when the water gets rocky, what does that boat do? Have you ever been in a boat when it's doing that? I remember one time when I was going on one cruise in my life. And when you go from Florida to the Bahamas, you cross something called the Gulf Stream. Okay? And about the time we were sitting out for dinner, we get the Gulf Stream. And you know what happened on that boat? That thing started doing this. And Mr. Bobby started feeling kind of funny. And Mr. Bobby had to go to his room and lay down for the rest of the evening. And got seasick. Okay? So imagine these disciples are on a boat. And they're, oh, and it was dark. And that made it even worse. But shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to the disciples, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they cried. Jesus immediately spoke to them, don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. And Peter spoke up, Lord, if it is really you, tell me to come out to you, walking on the water. Yes, no? Jesus said. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking toward Jesus. But when he started looking around and saw the waves being blown about by the wind, he was afraid and he began to sink. And Peter cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus reached out his hand and called Peter. Why did you doubt? Jesus asked. We see even a grown-up fisherman like Simon Peter needed a hand from Jesus when it came to walking on the water. So sometimes when we go through difficult things, right? Maybe we're struggling with something in school. Uh, or whatever it might be, we're struggling to learn something. We're just having a difficult time. Our parents are there. Our grandparents would be saying, I got a helpline to bring us and pull us back up. And it's not just boys and girls who have one. As parents, as adults, as grown-ups, just like Simon Peter, we go through hard times. Simon Peter was out on the water and physically got afraid. And none of us may be out in that same specific situation. But sometimes parents deal with things like job struggles, a job gets hard, or we lose a job, or we struggle with relationships, or whatever it might be. And sometimes it can feel like Simon Peter. Everything can seem dark. Everything can seem like it's just stormy and we're struggling. You know how you get afraid sometimes in a storm? to do Waymaker. Um, it's kind of crazy how the song correlated with my life and the Sunday school message this morning a little bit. I'll just tell y'all, living without power is kind of tough. <laughs> I don't know if y'all have lost power, but I did not have power in my apartment for three days. It kind of got restored last night, so praise God for that. But it was rough. Um, but, you know, God had a plan, and he had a way in that. And this morning in our Sunday school, we were talking about God.
God providing everything that we need according to his will and his purpose for us. And I think it kind of perfectly aligns with this song um, that even though we don't understand and comprehend everything that God has planned for us, that he's still the way maker and he still works miracles Amen. despite everything going on. So um, I'm just going to worship and sing this song and pour out our hearts to the Lord because that's who our God is.
very familiar song, so I'm going to ask her to make her way up. You guys can be seated for this. So thank you for your worship this morning. Good morning. late February this year for a triathlon called a full Ironman and that consists of a 2.4 mile swim 112 miles on the bike and then a marathon afterwards 26.2 miles so I'll total 140.6 miles and there's a time limit of 17 hours and if you're not done in 17 hours they kick you off the course and sometimes, if you're close, they'll let you finish, but then they still consider you that you didn't finish. They don't, you don't get the time. So everything you have to do that day, that includes going from changing from one sport to the next, stopping for restroom breaks, getting something to eat, you know, if you have a flat tire, everything counts towards your time. So and you can't have any outside assistance. And so just to put it in perspective for you, if you're a pro man, like, there's pros that do this, too, and then there's just us little people. Um, the man, the average time for the professional man to finish it is 9 hours and 20 minutes. And the average time for the professional female to finish is 10 hours and 20 minutes. And so then I looked it up and said the average time for my age group, which is just a little bit over 21, um, <laughs> is 14 hours and 30 minutes. And I predict, when I started in February, that I would be 17 hours. And so I've been training, I've been getting better, so now I predict I might be 16. So it's somewhere between 16 and 17. So I'm not even as fast as the average woman in my own age group. <laughs> so all those other people are going to finish stronger, faster and stronger, they're going to finish way ahead of me. So I don't have a lot of room for error. So there's just a little bit of pressure. <laughs> so, but next Saturday I start. November 7th, between 6 and 7 a.m., which means I'm going to be finishing somewhere between 11 p.m. and midnight. Um, and I'll just tell you, there is a tracker. If you go to your app store called Ironman Tracker, and you can put my name in. It's for the November 7th race in Florida. You can follow me all day, <laughs> all night. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just FYI, Charlie's doing it too. Charlie Holder, my son, you can follow him. So you'll see like a little blue dot. So if it never gets out of the water, you'll know I drown. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I've had an anchor burst for a long time when I do triathlons, and, and I'm holding on to that, and it's sort of a twofold for me because it's as an athlete, but also as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that comes from Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And in this verse, Paul's talking about, you know, he has a lot of reasons to forget what's behind. Because he's, you know, participated in the stoning of Stephen. You know, we've all done things that we're sorry for, and we all live in the tension of what, what has been and, you know, what we have been and what we want to be. And, you know, because our hope is in Christ, we can let go of the past. Amen. We can look forward to the future, to what God will help us become. So, Amen. you know, that's the, the spiritual side. Paul's telling us not to dwell on those things, but concentrate on our relationship with Jesus. So we can realize, you know, that we are forgiven and we can live a life of faith and obedience, a life to, that's full and meaningful, and that's what he's called for us. And so all that to say that this process that started really seven years ago, just as a way to go to the gym and work out, I couldn't have foreseen that seven years later the Lord would have me doing a full Ironman. But he showed me two things in that time. One, that I'm physically capable of doing more than I ever thought that I could. And two, that I'm spiritually capable 
of doing more than I ever thought that I could. Ever thought that I could be for him or ever thought, you know, that I might be used by him. So that in turn really allows me to live that fuller, you know, now I am living that fuller, more abundant life that he has for me. And it's come through obedience. Amen. You know, and and I just I have to do like what Paul says sometimes. I have to forget what's behind. You know, if I fail and I have to go on to the next day, and that's a whole new opportunity to strain towards what is ahead. And so he's helped me grow a lot and, and like right now I've recently been given the opportunity to teach in the ladies' class with two other people. And, you know, that's something that I never would have thought that I could do. And, you know, if I think about in 30 years, and I don't want to name too many names because I'm sure I'll leave people out, and I don't want to do that, but women who have gone before me and taught that ladies' class, you know, Susan Browning taught that class for years. Um, Beth Doyle has taught a ladies' class, most recently with Cindy and Vicki. You know, I don't feel qualified to follow behind in those shoes. But if I train, go each Sunday and study and do it, I'll get stronger, I'll get better, and the Lord will be there with me. But, you know, it's important to me as I spend time in this triathlon world and rub shoulders with other athletes that I'm able to shine his light to them and let them know that I believe in Jesus Christ. And, and I don't, I don't want to use this time that I'm in that world and not you know, give glory to God as, as I do this each day. And so my hope is that, you know, as I, as I tackle hard things and this hard thing called life, you know, that on, on my way of my journey of spending eternity with him, you know, I've been able to form a little circle of friends and many of them know the Lord and we're able to audibly encourage each other. And a lot of times when we're training, you know, I'll take the time to pray with everybody who comes to show up that day. And some of them know the Lord and some of them don't. So, you know, I'm able to be a witness to, to those who don't that this is my lifestyle and this is what I believe in, you know. But my other anchor thing that I've had through this time is um, a song called Oceans. And for me, it plays off of Matthew 14, 22 and 23, which Bobby just read to you. <laughs> But, um, you know, it's, it is talking about when, when Jesus was walking on the water. And, um, and then, you know, they saw him, and they were terrified, and they thought it was a ghost. But Jesus said to them, take courage, don't be afraid. Peter asked the Lord if it was him. If it is, tell me to come out. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But then he saw the wind, and he was afraid. And he began to think and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, without hesitation, Jesus reached out his hand and said, You of little faith, why do you doubt? And then they climbed in the boat, and the wind, wind died down. And so sometimes we doubt, but we don't need to, you know? So... The, the lyrics to this song begin, he calls us out upon the water. And to me, the water is any place that he takes us that's out of our comfort zone. You know, on water, we're not sure-footed like we are on land. You know, what's it going to be like out there? But that's where we find him. You know, that's where he was, on the water, when he told Peter to come. That's where, through faith, we can stand with him. That's where we can call him. We just have to keep our eyes above the waves. I knew I was going to cry. <laughs> That's where his grace is sufficient. It's in the deepest waters. His grace abounds, and his sovereign hand will be our God. And like Peter, we can be afraid of things that we're about to tackle. But we know from past experience with him that he's never failed us to meet us where we need him, and he won't start now. Amen. So while I'm aware that swimming 2.4 miles in the ocean is a big undertaking and it's completely taking me out of my comfort zone, because there's nowhere to practice that in Atlanta, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to carry my anchor verse with me 
I'm going to carry my anchor song. I'm going to carry my Jesus. And I'm going to let my soul rest in his embrace, knowing that I am his and he is mine. Yeah. So I'm going to do that song for y'all, maybe. <laughs> Darren, did they tell you number two? Okay. If you need to stand up and move around a little bit, that's okay. Uh, uh, thank you so much for, for serving yesterday. 
Many of you spent hours here, you know, even before it, it started, you were um, you know, preparing, you were putting it all together, and uh, I appreciate that. So, uh, it, it was a total team, total family effort, I guess, as we say. <laughs> so, uh, man. All right, well, let me uh, get kind of settled here. We're going to be in uh, 1 Samuel 8 uh, this morning, and this was, this was the passage that the Lord put on my heart to preach a couple weeks ago, and then last week, you know, I shifted things, and, and um, I, there was a purpose for that. I, I think I got some validation and some response back, and I think that was a, a wise thing to change. And um, But also, for me this week, there, there was something that I had not seen yet in this passage. I guess the Lord said, you need another week in that. So, <laughs> so we looked at it, and I uh, looked at it again, and so we're going to be in this passage today. Hopefully, if you, if you see the outline there on the title, you're like, how to reject God as king, uh, a step-by-step, -step, you're like, hopefully you're reading the sarcasm in that, okay, <laughs> because, or else I'm going to be fired later today, so um, that, that is not where we're talking about, uh, you know, so we're, we're going to look at a bad example here of, of what Israel did and how they rejected God and, and chose a, a, a man, a godly person at that time, but a man who was not God. And, and rejected God. So we're going to look at that this morning. Um, and we're just going to get into it. Let me pray, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we need your help this morning, and I need your help. Uh, speak through me. Help me to share the things that you put on my heart this week and this past week. Um, Lord, may our ears and hearts be open to hear what you want to tell us, Lord. May, may it bring us some comfort, even though this is a, a bad, negative example. May May we have some understanding about maybe our current culture today and where we're at as a nation as we come just two, three days before an election. And may we have just some understanding of where we're at, Lord, and, and you show us what our responsibility should be uh, as we walk out of here this morning and we face our culture and our nation as believers who are just following hard after you and just seeking you with all our hearts, God. We love you, and we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, you know, some of the, the Bible, uh, you read the Bible, and you're like, whoa, that's in the Bible. But we have to remember that all of the Bible is not prescriptive. Just because something is in the Bible doesn't mean that that's what we should do, that's what we should follow. It's a description of what happened and you know, people's choices they made, oftentimes poor because guess what? We would have made the same ones, you know. It's funny when you look at Adam and Eve in the garden, and the, the students are, yeah, Brother John, if if I was there, would I have made the same thing? Yeah, we probably would. We would have made the same choice because we're all human, sinful people. So uh, we can take some examples from this. So. All right. So, yeah, just a few days before the election here, uh, you know, last week we talked about not worrying, just leaving it to the Lord. So... Today, I, I want to help you kind of see where we're at as a nation, because I believe that for the most part, America was, began as a, a Christian nation. The, many of the founders that signed the document, you know, the independence, uh, Declaration of Independence, all these founding people, you know, a vast majority of them were believers. They, they wanted religious freedom, and they came to America for that, to get away from the oppressive nations that they were from and uh, and it's really changed over the last 200 plus years in, in a lot of different ways um, we still have a lot of freedoms but uh, you know Christianity is is you know being uh, kind of pushed down a little bit you know we're told to keep your you can have your faith but you need to keep it private don't don't bring it out into the public square don't uh, you know don't Vote on your morals, but don't bring your Bible into the, the voting booth. Um, and, and that's not what the original founders had intended. And, and that's just as we become more and more secular as a nation. So I just want to give you, I, I believe this is a perfect parallel uh, here in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8 to kind of where we're at as a nation. And uh, maybe we can learn from it a little bit. Maybe we can, we can walk out of here today with, okay, this is my one job that I need to do as a believer from here on out when it comes to, you know, where we're at as a nation. So let me read to you the, the passage, starting in verse 1. 
All right. When Samuel grew old, uh, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest game. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint us a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said this, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord God told him, Listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. They have done this from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me, serving other gods, so they are doing it to you. Now listen to them. But warn them solemnly so that, uh, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with, and the chariots and, and the horses, and they will run in front of those chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your maid, men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your cattle and donkeys. Oops, I already heard that. He will take a tenth of your flocks and yourselves. You will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief for the king you have chosen, and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then they will. Uh, then they will, we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord, and the Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel told the men of Israel, Everyone, go back to your own tent. All right, so three things I want to give you kind of in this um, message this morning, and they they kind of relate to each other. And this is... Uh, one thing leads to the next. And I, I believe uh, that, that we need to see this because we need to look at this ourselves in our culture as a church, as the church universal, the church in America. We need to see some of these things that are in this passage here. Uh, so the first step right here, this is one I didn't really see the first week. This is what the Lord just kind of hit me broadside on the head with a two by four and said, hey, Start with yourself, Pastor John. Look at this. Look at uh, verses 1 through 3 here. This is the first step to rejecting God as king is that pastors and church leaders fail to obey God. Look, look what happened there in the scripture. You know, Samuel was this spiritual leader. You know, he and many other people before him, like Moses and Joshua and some of the judges that we looked at, they led Israel hearing directly from the Lord. And here Sammy was, and he was getting old, according to the scripture says. And verse 3 there says, But his sons did not walk in his ways, the ways of Samuel that he had done in the Lord there. Uh, you know, so, and then it gets a little bit descriptive. How, how exactly did his sons that he set in charge not walk in the way? Well, according to the verse 3, it says that they turned aside for dishonest gain. They accepted bribes. Okay, we're, you know, exactly what kind of bribe? Well, you know, I'll bless you. I'll pray for you a little more. Maybe you're, <laughs> you will do this. I'll accept the bribes. And then uh, the last part of verse 3, it says they perverted justice. So, you know, you know when, we, when you think about justice here, maybe we're thinking about 2020. You know, I think right now there's a very, a very narrow aspect of what, a lot of people think about when they think about justice. You know, with everything that's gone on this summer, we're thinking about 
okay, justice is racial inequality, and we're looking at, but justice, according to the scriptures, is much bigger. It encompasses a lot more. So kind of take a step back and see that, it, you know, it's dealing with the, the community, providing for the poor. It could be, you know, all these other things, just not just what we're seeing maybe in our culture right now that's being, you know, pushed to the forefront there. But so his sons perverted justice. You know, they did some dishonest things here. Um, it's just... You know, just something for us. So the first step in rejecting God as king, it starts with the church leaders, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we, we need to, and I'm speaking to myself, we need to hold fast to God's word. We need to hold to the truth Amen. and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach God's word no matter what it says, no matter what the nation or the culture around me says that, you know, they, they think that this is okay and that's okay. There are too many pastors, too many churches who are bowing to the whims of culture and, and the pressure to accept certain things in the culture that, that we know are not biblical. Um, I was in line to vote Friday, and a couple of people behind me, they started talking about seminary. And I'm, and I'm a little ear, oh, 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 oh. So I kind of turned to the side so I could hear a little bit. And, and they're talking about where they went to seminary. Uh, there was these three people. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll jump in that. No, just, just listen. So anyway, and and um, they started talking about the seminary they went to. And, oh, I wanted to go to a liberal seminary. So I went to Union. And I went to, because I wanted to see, I wanted to be more relevant. It was one of the comments that one of the guys said. And I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that was just an example I was like, thank you, Lord. You just gave me a little illustration for, for Sunday morning. But, um, you know, they, they were willing to say, you know, this isn't so much as important as being able to connect with people and for them to like me or whatever that conversation might have been. And later on, they kind of split up. I started talking to the one that was kind of quiet. And I said, I went to seminary too. <laughs> oh, yeah, where'd you go? Well, I went to Liberty University. Oh, and that, that was why, you know, that kind of settled things down there, you know. Because Liberty is very concerned, although Liberty's got some bad press lately. We're not going to talk about that, but hopefully they're cleaning up their house there. So, um, but anyway, it, it starts at the top, you know. We need to uh, hold as a church and as, as a community, we need to hold our pastors and our church leaders to the biblical standard. You know, if we're ever, if I ever say anything stupid, <laughs> um, and, you know, I expect you to come knock on my door or see me after church or after service. Brother John, you said that, and I'm sorry, but I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. We need to be held accountable uh, as spiritual leaders, as, you know, Bible study teachers and all these different aspects, you know. And I believe that if, if the, the church universal would do that all across our community, when some of these pastors go to these crazy seminaries and get these crazy ideas, or they come in there and they want to be liked and, and fill the pews, if we as believers would say, you know what, that's not right. You need to be held accountable. There needs to be some spiritual discipline there that, that takes place. Um, you know, the integrity of our spiritual leaders is important. It is, it's huge, you know. Uh, we've had, over the years, there's, there, the last two or three years, there's been several prominent uh, spiritual leaders who have come out on social media saying, well, I'm no longer a Christian, or they're worship leaders in some of these main bands, you know, and they, they come, well, I don't believe in God anymore, and they feel whatever the need, they feel like they have to tell everybody on social media about it. And, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's a little bit of our responsibility there. We don't need to put young leaders or people that are not strong in their faith in a position of leadership. For that reason, because they get up there and, man, all sorts of popularity and all this happens. And, you know, maybe they can, they don't have that solid foundation like they should. And there's, there's a reason why we have things in place where we put leaders in place who have proven themselves, have shown themselves to be solid in their beliefs and all that. So, you know, I would say, you know, first step for us as a church you're not a pastor, you're not maybe a church leader, but you hold us accountable to God's word. And when we veer off a little bit, you give us a, 
a gib slap. You watch NCIS, you give it a gib slap back on the back of the head. Hey, get back on track there, you know, whatever it is. Uh, focus, you know, and, and without that, we'll, we'll see, you know, it could be a lot different. So step number two on how to reject God as king, step by step guide, is that family leaders demand human security over God's leadership. Family leaders demand human security over godly leadership. Look at verse 4 there. It says, So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel. These are the elders here. This is not just the middle schoolers. Okay? This is the, the elders. These are the family leaders of Israel. These are the older ones that have had experience. And they should be trained and they know what is right and what is not. And so here we see that they come to Samuel. Hey, Samuel. And I thought about this this week, you know. I wonder. They, they had seen all these kings around them for probably a while. And maybe that thought was already there. Hey, man, I sure wish we had a king like those uh, Canaanites or those Assyrians or you know, whoever. Uh, and they're already talking about it. And then here when these ungodly leader Samuel's sons failed this was just maybe an excuse to say oh well, I got an idea for you there <laughs> you know instead of correcting the problem instead of putting godly leaders in place this is just an, an opportunity or an excuse for these elders to come in and say hey let's try this other idea let's try this out let's see how this works out so these leaders come, they're the ones that are in charge. They're the experienced ones. They're over their families. And look at verse 5. It says, it shows you where their, their hearts and their minds are, and their eyes are looking at. So give us a leader. Give us a king such as all the other nations have. They were not looking to God. They were looking around at everybody else. You know, and I think sometimes we as church, we can be guilty. We can look all the way around. We can look... Look at that church. Look what they're doing. Or look over there. Look at this group or this business. Look at how they're doing this. And, and, and we kind of get a little bit off track. And we, we start pulling in worldly ideas and concepts and things that, man, man if we would just get on that bandwagon, then, then, man, then the doors would be blowing open. And, man, people would be filling the pews. And, and, and somehow we get distracted by that. So we have to be careful like that. Uh, going down to verse 20 there, it says, you know, they wanted a king, they repeat again, with a king to lead us to go out to fight our battles. Uh, so they were, they were looking for, you know, they see all these other kings go out to battle, and the kings are out there, they're on the big horse, all this. And with God, he's, he's an invisible God. He's somebody that they can't put their hand on every single minute of the day. Well, the king, well, he's in the palace, or the king here. God is God. <laughs> and just think about that. We, we want to be able to control God a little bit. We want to be able to kind of know every little thing about that human leader and be able to control. Hey, we don't like that human. We can throw him out. We can find somebody else. But God, we can't control him. He's God. He does what he pleases. <laughs> you know, he will, he's over us. And so there's this idea they're looking at here, you know, and is, is, is dangerous. Um, J.D. Greer, I was reading, doing some things. He's an evangelist. He, he says there's, there's different ways to reject God. Here, Israel had rejected God. Uh, give us a king you know, to lead over us. There, for those, he says, uh, he said there's two ways to reject God. One is to reject him outright and to say that you're not going to follow him. That's the unbelievers. All right? But then he said there's a second way for believers who, who reject God, who trusted God with their salvation, but they reject God on a trust level, refusing to trust him and to allow him uh, to, to work in their lives. And for, you know, we want that human security, but we'll say, you know, I, I, I trust you, God, but only this, this much. And, and so I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you trust him for your salvation, but... You are yet to trust him in other areas of your life. Um, you know, a physical king could be held and put tabs on, but God, you can't control him. So that's 
part of the reason why we want to uh, really kind of escape and get out of that. And then the third step for us this morning, if you are looking at how to reject God as your king, the third step you want to do is for the people to ignore the warning of consequences and still choose the wrong. For the people to ignore the warning of consequences and still choose the wrong. And you see this in the last uh, several verses here, verses 10 through 20. Uh, God says, okay, Samuel, hey, they have not rejected you, but it's me, it's God they have rejected here. And he says, I want you to tell them what's going to take place. So seven, uh, six times in six verses here, the word take is used. I don't know if you, you caught that when I was reading. I tried to emphasize that a little bit. Uh, verse 11 and 12, it says, he will take the men for military service. Uh, verse 13, it says, he will take the women to serve himself in the palace. Verse 14, he will take your private land and give it to others. Anybody seen parallels with today maybe yet? I don't know. <laughs> uh, verse 15, 17 talks about he will, he will take taxes from you. It uses the word, he will take a tenth from you. Uh, that's the exact same word for the tithe as well. Think about that. You know, it's replacing the tithe and it's becoming taxes. Uh, I, I said this last week in, in the sermon. I think too many people are relying on government to be their everything right now. Uh, you know, the, the, and people are looking to the government for every kind of social program. There's like over 70 different social programs that provide a to Z for different people. Some of those programs are needed, but I wonder how much are, are we using that as a as a crutch for people to to have them dependent on that? You know, I don't know. that's that's a discussion we can look at sometime. But that you know, when when the government becomes every every single answer, the church is less and less effective. And we, as God's people, man, if, if we would reach out and give people, we, not only would we give people providing for them, you know, physical needs and food and different things, but we could also provide something that the government can't come close to, and that's a answer to a spiritual need for something in their heart, you know. We, we were talking about integrity in our Sunday school class this morning, uh, looking at the Ten Commandments, not stealing, you know, don't tell a lie. It's that integrity, it's that, that need for justice that people want and desire and if we are not given it as, as believers, as followers of Christ, you know, people are trying to come up with it for themselves. They're trying to create some type of justice. It's not a biblical justice. It's their idea of justice. But we can give them true justice if we will act rightly and have character and integrity. That, that is important. Uh, verse 16, it says, He will take your, your servants, your male servants, your maid servants, and your, you know, all that for his own use. So there again... And then Samuel says in verse 18, hey, you're going to regret it. <laughs> you will regret it. You will cry out. Well, on this day, when this happens, you will cry out to the Lord, and he will not answer you. That's, Samuel didn't, you know, what do we call He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't just kind of say, well, you know, this could happen. He said, this is going to happen if you choose this. This is what's going to take place. And he, he explained everything to them. And in verse 19, it says, But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Even after knowing everything that was going to take place, they still chose against what God told them was going to take place. So that's the third step. That when we know the truth, when we know God has spoken to us as God's people, and hey, this is going to happen if you do this, then this is going to happen. The people willingly rebelled against God and said, no, we want it anyway. And that, that's the third step. You know, it starts from the top, all the way from the, the, the leaders there with Samuel's sons to the pastors, our church leaders, and it, and it works it way, its way down to us. That if, if we want a godly nation, we want a, you know, a person in the office that is a godly man, it, it starts with our spiritual leaders. It starts with our, our elders, our family, the mature believers. 
leading the families, and it works its way all the way down to the individuals in the pew that where we say, you know what, I know God says this, but I'm going to do the opposite anyway. I'm still going to go the opposite way. So uh, go ahead, go to that uh, next slide, Olivia, there. Um, actually, go back. I'm sorry. <laughs> go back to the, the quote about giving. And Yeah, all right. This is, you know, people, we want a God, you know, this is, this is the, the dichotomy basically in it right here. You know, people are takers. People will take, take, take. We saw that last night. Uh, some of the ladies that were doing the food, yeah, some people had hot dogs. Some people had two and three. And, uh, that's okay. You know, they, they come back. They were hungry. I'm glad we were able to, to feed them. But, you know, people will take as much as you're willing to give them. You know, oh, you want some more candy? Yeah, here's, here's another scoop. You know, we, we found that out last night. But people, by nature, are takers. But God, by nature, he's a giver. Me, amen. He gives, he gives, he gives grace, like Lane was singing in her song this morning. There's, you know, oceans of grace that God gives us. And, and God gives us his very best. He gives us his son. He, he died for us. He willingly did that. So God's, you know, people are takers, God's a giver. So when it comes to who do we want to lead us, you know, I'd say, hey, let's look towards the Lord. Let's, let's give, let's have a leader who's a giver. Let's not take somebody who's a taker. Put them there. Go ahead to the next slide. Let me just say, um, and then go on after that. So here's a quote from from C.S. Lewis. It kind of reminded me of this today when we're looking at this. Uh, he says, "There's only two kinds of people in the end: those who say to God, Thy will be done, and then those whom God says, Thy will be done." You know, God God is a giver. We see this here in the passage. Verse 20, it says that, um, when I find it, sorry. But the people refused to listen. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us to go out before us to fight our battles. Verse 21, yeah. When Samuel heard all the people had said, he repeated this before the Lord. Verse 22, the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. God gave them what they want, what they wanted. Okay, you want a king? This is what you're going to have. You know, when I look at America today, where we're at as a nation, I believe verse 22 is come to light in our nation. God gives us exactly what we want. You know, uh, we could, we don't have time for a political discussion, and I don't like politics as much anyway, but, you know, I, I think I've heard several people say, you know, this person was kind of put in for this reason or another, for that reason or another. Um, but, you know, we have a process where we vote, and we have a, a primary, and we have a general election, and people choose who they choose. We are the ones responsible for putting those people. You know, I've said it a couple of times, <laughs> 330 million people in America, these are your top two candidates. Good job, America. Great job. <laughs> you know, um, whatever, you, you know, and I, again, that whatever. But trying to stay apolitical here. But anyway, um, you know, we have a responsibility. We're the ones that put those people in the primaries. You know, and I realize that, you know, the Christians today are in the minority. And that's part of the reason why we have who we have in the office today. You know, Christians are in the minority today. Well, you can say, well, 70% of America is Christian. Well, that's in checking the box name only. I, I, I wonder what the real number is. We're, we are the minority. And, but I just implore you, your job, if you have not already voted, go put a godly person in there as best as you can. You know, maybe it's too late to start over in the primaries, but two years from now, four years from now, seek godly people to put into office. Do your very best. And, you know, and again, we're in the minority. We, we can't worry about who our neighbor votes for, who the person across the pew votes for, but we can do our part with that. Uh, you know, uh, so I just want to, just as we close this morning, I want to just, you know, again, give you a little bit of reason. Okay, this is why we're at, where we're at as a nation. This is why we, we're at the place where we're at. Because of, it's, it's a, I put it on myself first as a spiritual leader, as a pastor. And then I say for us as a church, for spiritual leaders, you know, the fathers in the homes, all of us individuals of the church, it's, it trickles down. We need to be the ones that, that stand up and, and speak up for what is right. Yeah. 
that is the reason why we're, we're seeing what we're seeing this morning. You know, you may be kind of depressed about, well, this is where we're at. <laughs> but I, I want to encourage you, you know, continue to pray for our leaders. Even though one is going to win uh, over the other, God is still in control. God is in charge. He will take care of you and I. He will see us through it. He will be with us through it. And as we will continue to trust in him and correct our own house, you know, Godly people, you know, you, you may not have, you say, well, I, I can't affect a church down the street because I'm a member of this church. But you can have conversations with people at your workplace, in the community. You can talk about, hey, man, we as church leaders, we need to stand up and we need to hold spiritual leaders accountable for staying, you know, with a foundation in God's word. Amen. And so I just want to encourage you going forward from here on out. You know, let's let's live every day to the best of our ability, following Christ, putting godly people in office, and, and just leave, you know, let it fall from there. Just have as, as many conversations as we can. This morning, uh, and just kind of as we close, we come to an invitation time. You know, maybe you, you're already doing these things. Maybe you've already putting the what you believe is the most biblical, godly person in office, and you, you're, you're continuing to do that. And you, you, you are trusting in the Lord through this whole election process. But, uh, you know, maybe there's somebody out here today that has not come to trust Jesus Christ as you, Lord, you're saved, right? and you uh, You can personally do that for your salvation by just asking him to come in your life. You know that God loves you, that he died on the cross for you, that he's a giver. He gave so much. He gave himself to die on the cross for your sins. To pay for your sin that you owe to my sin, that if we would trust in Him, we could have eternal life. Uh, if you'd like to ask Jesus Christ from your life, just ask Him to close your eyes for life, to get the other around. And if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, to be your Lord, your Savior, you can say a prayer like this: "Say, dear God, I know that I'm not perfect and that I have sin as well. Today, God, I want to come to you. I want to give you my life." I want to place my trust in you. Today, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Help me to turn and follow you with my life. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you pray that prayer this morning. I'd love to know about it. I'd love to just kind of help you in your next step about how you can grow in your relationship with Christ. Uh, if you want to come down and pray, if you want to come down and pray for our nation, pray for our leaders, the altar is open uh, this morning. Just let the Holy Spirit lead you and, and let Him guide you this morning. We'll do whatever He brings on your heart. Let's pray and then we'll turn it over to you. But dear God, this is your time. This is your altar. Lord, help us as a church not to look to a person to be an answer to our problem. We may look at these two major candidates and we say, well, I'll take this person over that person. But God, I pray that we would back it up even before that and say, God, these two are nothing compared to me. Lord, help us turn to first. Help us to go pray and to say, God, forgive us for maybe not beating out as, as Christians as we should have. Lord, help us to have uh, godly conversations with people. Help us to invite people to church to have gospel conversations. Tell people of the only good news that can really save them, and that is the relationship with you. Lord, I pray for our nation. I pray for our church this week. Lord, as we go, may you use us to be your, your hands and feet, be your mouthpiece as, as we come into a world that is without a lot of hope, that is without a lot of Answers. Help us to point people to the only answer 
course, that the Lord knows. Fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Uh, may that be our, our effective call this week as we offer them, as we face people before and after the election. Uh, Lord, help us to be light and salt in a, in a dark, peaceless world. Help us be a preservative that will help people uh, as they go throughout their daily life. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in our church service this morning. Yeah. Uh, we give you glory, God. Hey. Lord, I pray now as we turn and we come to the time we give our tithes and offerings to you. Lord, you've been so good to us, God. Hey. Uh, but, but help us to, to really, really recognize how good you are and help us to trust you even more, God. We've done, we've done so much with what we've given, or may we may be challenged to give more, to say, I'm going to trust you even more, and to be stretched a little more. So we'll take these offerings, these tithes today, and just pray to bless them, uh, bless the ones who give it, and we have total trust in you to do with it, uh, to, to go for the kingdom, and to provide for the church and all the ministries that we have. Lord, we thank you.